Uh, well, good morning, and uh, thank you for coming today. Uh, rarely do I get an opportunity to address a topic that's so uh, near and dear to my heart. Uh, many of you received an invitation from me, an invitation to serve, and your presence today gives me a great deal of hope uh, because the city is uh, confronting a significant problem. And I'm quite certain that city government will not be able to solve this problem on our own. Uh, we need you. So over the past year, I've become con increasingly concerned about the widening gap uh, between what I've been referring to as our two Columbias, others have referred to Tale of Two Cities, uh, because poverty is increasing in Colombia for all groups, white, Hispanic, Asian, black, and it's increasing most profoundly in the black community. I'm gonna tell a story this morning about how the city council developed the city's new strategic plan and why it's more important than our last plan. This last winter, uh, we began studying the community. We did this to prepare the most accurate picture we could prepare to present to the city council uh, so they could clearly see who we are as a city and how we're doing as a community. We found a number of things, a number of excellent things that make us proud to be living here in Columbia. The economy overall has recovered from the Great Recession. Uh, we are a growing city, 3.5% unemployment, uh, lower than the state or the nation. Graduation rates are improving. We're seeing positive growth in business startups and entrepreneurism. Violent crime rates are at their lowest point in 30 years. Most people love living here. In fact, 79% in the most recent survey said they were satisfied or very satisfied with the quality of life they've made here. And although these are positive and promising indicators, we also learned some troubling truths. Unemployment for African-American residents is almost four times the rate for white Colombians. A typical black household makes 60% what the typical white household makes, right here in Colombia. We've lost half of our manufacturing jobs and we replace them with retail, uh, which tends to mean minimum wage, no benefits. Clearly, not everyone in Colombia is thriving. We realized that we needed to learn more about poverty in Columbia. Uh, so I asked Angela Hirsch from Central Missouri Community Action to conduct a poverty simulation at a pre-council meeting. I think Angela's here. Wave your hand. There you are. Thank you for coming. Uh, that simulation was eye-opening, to say the least. The simulation showed us how hopeless it must feel uh, to try to pay the bills uh, when you're impoverished uh, without things that many of us count on like affordable housing and reliable transportation. Poverty can feel like a prison. Uh, escaping it seems so impossible. Uh, so as we reflected on what we can do to provide escape routes out of that prison, uh, it's easy to say I don't know how to fix this problem, right? Or poverty's been around forever. You can't fix that. Uh, I've heard people say the city shouldn't try to deal with social problems. But after all, we've been in the social service business from the very beginning. Uh, what's our police department, if not a social service? Uh, what's public health? What's neighborhood services, if not social services? So the idea of doing something to shrink poverty is an intimidating idea. Uh, can we even do it? Well, if there was ever anyone who understood poverty, uh, I think it must have been Nelson Mandela, who survived apartheid and poverty in South Africa. Uh, and he had this to say. He said, overcoming poverty is not a task of charity. It's an act of justice. Uh, like slavery and apartheid, poverty is not natural. It is man-made, and it can be overcome, 
and eradicated by the actions of human beings. Sometimes it falls on a generation to be great. You can be that great generation. So, with all those thoughts in mind, uh, Council and staff embarked upon the creation of a new strategic plan uh, and that would try to impact poverty, uh, which is the root cause of so many barriers to success. You know, for example, it's hard to learn when you're hungry or your teeth hurt. Uh, teenage pregnancy and dropout rates and criminal behavior are just some of the negative uh, effects of poverty that poverty exacerbates. So when I started working in city government, uh, I took an oath to abide by a code of ethics that's administered by the International City Managers Association. The fourth tenet of that code of ethics states that we recognize that the chief function of local government at all times is to serve the best interest of all the people. So because of this and my own personal ethical code, uh, I can't be content where the majority of our city has an excellent opportunity for an exceptional life, uh, while a smaller group has a far harder experience. So, what you will not see in this strategic plan are specific mentions about normal day-to-day -day operations. Uh, there are certain things that a city does and will continue to do, such as pick up the trash, no matter how we choose to do that. Uh, provide clean drinking water. You know, these are standard services. Uh, they're not addressed in the strategic plan, uh, but don't be concerned. Uh, we are still going to provide them and perform those services uh, at the highest level that we can. So day-to-day -day operations will continue as before. Uh, the strategic plan that we have moves away from the whirlwind of the day-to-day -day operations and it addresses what we aspire to accomplish as we are a growing community and offers tactics on how to achieve success for all citizens. And we will do so through five main areas of concentration. You might be able to guess what these are. Jobs, equity, public safety, infrastructure, and a high performance workforce. So our first strategic priority area centers around the economy. It all starts with a job and a living wage. I know of no path out of poverty that doesn't include a good job. Uh, did you know that back in uh, 1968, the purchasing power of the minimum wage would be the equivalent of $10.55 an hour today? And yet the minimum wage in Missouri is $7.65. So our plan directs us to establish a baseline of the current jobs that pay a living wage and then try to increase that number. So we need to attract new businesses and expand existing ones that pay a living wage. The median wage gap between white and minority households in Columbia is increasing. We want to reduce that gap by at least 5% in three years. Achievable goals is what we're shooting for. The skills gap in the labor market is also increasing, and we have strategies now to reduce that by 10% in three years by creating a work-ready community through our partnership with Ready and through programs such as Project Lead the Way, Job Point, Care, Cradle to Career. Uh, we can address these gaps. We want to expand air service and build a new terminal, uh, which has the power to significantly increase commerce. And we want to make the city friendlier to disadvantaged business enterprises, reduce some of the red tape that they have to go through. We want to make Columbia a city where people from all walks of life have a fair shot at success and prosperity. The second strategic priority focuses on social equity and addresses the question how can we strengthen our community so all individuals can thrive? To me, social equity means correcting the imbalances that keep people from breaking out of the cycle of poverty. It means offering an intentional leg up to provide opportunities to those who need the most help to develop 
personal responsibility and improve their odds for success. This is not a government handout. I know from personal experience, however, that without uh, living wage jobs and access to education, uh, it's nearly impossible to break out of poverty. So this, I know, your income determines where you live. Uh, and so we're going to determine three areas of the community where the data tells us there are dire needs for community building and social equity. Uh, to choose these three, we are going to analyze all of the information we have about our city. We're looking not only at crime-related maps, but also free and reduced lunch maps, household income, fire calls, energy usage maps, among many others. Uh, we will reach out to neighborhood leaders and work with them to develop a plan that's specific to that place. We're going to reach out to our community partners, many of you here today, uh, and we'll bring all of our combined efforts to bear on those places. And we're going to address the issues identified by those neighbors. Imagine what we can do together, focused. Third strategic priority is centered around public safety, and it asks, you know, how can we improve citizen satisfaction? No matter where you live, you want to be safe. Uh, and you want to feel secure. As I've stated before, the violent crime rates are at their lowest in 30 years, yet events in Ferguson and around the country have created mistrust and fear. Our ballot initiatives to increase our public safety workforce were rejected, which means our efforts at community policing will remain limited. Still, our goal is to improve citizen satisfaction with police services 6% by 2019. We will also strive to increase citizen perception of safety by 6% in three years. Uh, we will conduct an optimization study to seek innovative methods to decrease officer workload so we can focus on community policing. If we can achieve this, uh, we will seek a ballot initiative to increase staffing in 2017. Our fire department is equally understaffed and with the help of public support at the voting booth uh, we will increase fire personnel in 2017 as well. So the fourth strategic priority area is infrastructure. Uh, we don't want to leave anyone behind and we want to connect our community so every neighborhood deserves sidewalks, uh, street lights, parks, we have a long history of planning for the future through comprehensive plans, capital improvement plans, plans for each utility, the East Area Plan, the Sasaki Plan, and many others. Uh, and over the past two years, we've seen ballots pass to support sewers, stormwater, electricity, roads, police substations, and fire trucks, with all with significant margins of victory, by the way. So strategically, we've challenged ourselves by asking, uh, how can we build the future today? Uh, so how can we provide better transportation services for all, especially those who depend on it uh, for their means of, uh, of transportation? So by continually examining ridership usage, and we're uh, going to do an RFP to have a, have a consultant come in and help us think about the data. We're going to improve transit services to key areas in our community. Uh, we'll continue to implement our complete streets policy to make sure everyone has the opportunity to live in a walkable, bikeable, drivable neighborhood. I think we've got the drivable part. Uh, we're going to strive to maintain a current portfolio of natural areas and working with all of our constituents. Uh, we're going to identify additional parks and preservation opportunities as the city grows. So the fifth and final strategic priority area turns the magnifying glass on ourselves and it addresses the areas of operational excellence. Uh, we can't hope to achieve progress in the first four without a high performance workforce. So we want to continue our employee focused compensation philosophy and implement a coaching based supervisory practice. 
We'll maintain and expand upon our reward and recognition programs, and we're going to train aspiring leaders through our city university. And above all, we're going to increase communication with our employees through a citywide continuous improvement program. Our contact center is on track to provide a one phone number service for all city services by 2019. When we created the contact center, there were 154 phone numbers for residents to try to sort through. Uh, we hope to reduce this to just three uh, so that residents will have one number to call, they'll reach a real person who can answer any question they have or take ownership of the problem they have and set up a service call so we can fix that problem. So that's it, that's our plan. Uh, we will continue to provide a high level of service to all of our citizens just as before and working with partners, we'll endeavor to lighten the burden of poverty by creating new Larging existing escape routes out of poverty. You know, uh, people have said that we need to create jobs, and they're right. But look around us. We have Ready, we have the Columbia Area Jobs Foundation, we have angel investors, we have incubators at the university and Ready for new companies. We have an amazing Chamber of Commerce. We have Veterans United and many other private employers who are growing or hiring. We also have many economic development tools we've not used that are proven to create jobs. So we are capable of creating jobs. Critics will say, and rightly so, that many impoverished people are not ready to work. They don't have the skills. They don't know how to work. But look around us. If there's ever been a community built on education, we're it. Think of what we already do to prepare people for that job out of poverty. Amazing public schools. Uh, Moberly Area Community College has an impressive presence right here in Columbia. The Career Center, Job Point, Care Program. And let's not forget Columbia College, Stevens, the University of Missouri. We're capable of helping people get ready for work. So people will say we need more affordable housing, and they're right. But look around us, right? We have the Columbia Housing Authority. We have Habitat for Humanity. Job Point builds affordable homes. And we have tax credits that encourage the private sector to build affordable apartments. We have CDBG and home programs. We are capable of increasing the amount of affordable housing. People will say we need to make housing energy efficient so working poor families can afford to keep their house that they rent or buy, and they're right. Look around us, right? We have the water and light department that subsidizes energy retrofits for homes. We have the federal weatherization programs. We have a modern building code, which results in new housing that's far more energy efficient than it used to be. We've even built a net zero home, and it was affordable. So we are capable of building more net zero housing. Finally, people will say we need to do something about wages. And they're right. Our national minimum wage just doesn't keep up with the actual cost of living for anyone. Now, you know what I'm going to say, all right? Look around us. St. Louis and Kansas City are taking steps to increase their minimum wage. Uh, Subway is advertising $9 per hour to start. That's $1.35 more than minimum wage. Stevens College has increased its minimum wage to $10 per hour. We're getting ever nearer to 1968. So it's my hope that we can, through our efforts, encourage many other employers to follow Dr. Lynch's leadership, do the right thing by the people who make their businesses, our universities, our cities, the places that we all love to work in, live here, play in. We are capable of paying human beings a living wage. So what I see when I look around is that we have what we need to shrink poverty. The tools and the partners are here. If we have the courage to try it, we can do this together. We have resources, expertise, and the passion to create one Columbia from two 
one Columbia that provides opportunity for every citizen who lives here. From the student who graduates and decides to start a business, to the retiree who's decided to spend the remaining years in a community full of vitality and art, and the single parent who struggles to make ends meet, or to the person wanting to break out of poverty and just doesn't know how. We owe all of them our best efforts. So thank you for your time. That concludes my remarks. And uh, the draft strategic plan is available in the back of the room there and on the website. And uh, I think we do have a little time left if we want to have some questions or just have a conversation. Thank you again. If there are no questions, there are more donuts and coffee. Cheryl. <laughs> Thank you for the comment. You know, it's, a, it's a, a rewarding thing to go through the process and to have the council here. And I think the commission's here as well, so I don't know if we have two official meetings or one. But, uh, but just coming up with this uh, logo in the back was, it was a group effort. Uh, choosing the words is something we do very carefully. You know, wordsmithing probably takes as much time as coming up with ideas, right? And so social equity was something the whole council chose and uh, I'll embarrass Mike Trapp he thought of this uh, uh, way to present it that, that you've been looking at the whole time so it's uh, it's a team effort and uh, I think Carl you might have been the first one to say the word social equity and we're uh, uh, you know it just seemed to capture what it was we were talking about so it's uh, it's been a great team effort yes being very upfront about social equity. I think if you look around us, it's an issue everywhere, not just here. It also allows us to address our personal ideologies about who we tell, who doesn't we tell, and our responsibility to each other. And I especially thank you for being specific about the needs of African Americans and Latino, not being afraid to say that black people in this community are having a much harder time than people who are not. And we need to really deal with that because it's a very serious issue that's affecting health, education, every aspect of life. So I hope that people come to the table and keep having those conversations to help people deal with their ideologies about um, all of us as Thank you. Yes. Hi, I was wondering exactly uh, what did you guys mean by uh, public safety workforce, and then uh, what outcomes did you guys see happening with the increase of that? Uh, great question. So what do we mean by public safety and increasing that workforce? So uh, the city government overall, due to a number of things, but most, uh, uh, most importantly, our eroding sales tax uh, revenue, uh, we're, we're understaffed across the city, about 30% in every, every function we provide. Uh, so it does force you to get pretty efficient, right? And uh, that's true with public safety. We reached a point in police and fire where we really don't have a lot of room left to do things uh, like community policing. Uh, we're really running call to call to call. So uh, the goal there is if we could get back to the resources we used to have, uh, we could have a robust community policing program and uh, without that uh, we either have to have new revenue to do that or the federal government has to begin taxing the internet and uh, there's reluctance to do that but that's the bottom line is Amazon's eating our lunch right so uh, uh, and it isn't a fair playing field for the mom-and-pop shop over here who does pay sales tax 
So it's, uh, it's something that we have to wrestle with as a country and, and many cities uh, live and die on sales tax. This, isn't, this is not unique to us. But either we fix that problem or we have to uh, find a new revenue stream if we want to do something significant about uh, the size of our public safety workforce. So that's what we're talking about there. Yes. One more question. Um, so what about the issue of uh, those who have criminal backgrounds? So how can we work to help those with criminal backgrounds find jobs, get better education, and uh, be able to get proper jobs? Great question. It was about uh, how do we help folks that are uh, have served their time in, in prison or jail and they're re-entering uh, the community and the workforce. How do we help them do that? Uh, I'm really proud to work with these folks, the council. They've, they've done something really big about that in the last year uh, through the realization of a couple things. Uh, these are our people, right? And they're coming home. So do you want to help them or ignore it? And we've decided not to ignore it. And so what we did was we got behind some proven techniques that, that, are, that help. And ban the box is what it's commonly referred to. And it came through the mayor's uh, violence task force work. And uh, for the city government, it's been very easy to implement. And we just take the background check and put it with the drug test at the very end. After you found the right person, you do those two checks. And what it does is rather than keep anyone with a record from even applying, never getting an interview, it lets them get the interview. And then at the end, uh, you decide, you know, was a DUI 10 years ago really worth not having this great person on our staff? No. So uh, you get to make the decision at the end. And that's been an, uh, huge for the city, easy for us. It can't work for every company, and so that's why we worded our ordinance that way. There are exemptions. You know, I think of uh, Veterans United. They have a federal law. They must do the background check at the beginning. So our ordinance says, well, we recognize that. Then you should. You need to do that. Uh, so in that case, they're exempt from it. But uh, that was a big step we took to do that very thing. Yes, Mary. I just want to commend you for uh, calling together uh, this meeting and to share with us your, your plans for the future because, you know, if you're a leader and you're walking and nobody is behind you, you just take a walk and not me. So, <laughs> so, thank you. Thank you for the City Council so much for uh, recognizing uh, the big problems that we have in the community and to try to start doing something to correct some of those old Thank you so much. Yes. Cards on the table back here. So uh, some of you got them, some of you may have not. If you're interested in learning more information about the strategic plan um, or have any thoughts you want to share, if you would fill those out and just leave those on the table back here, that would be great. Another just bit of housekeeping. Um, so this isn't adopted yet. It's going to be uh, on the agenda on Tuesday. Monday's a holiday. Everyone enjoy Labor Day, please. Uh, but the council will meet on Tuesday and take up this plan. And so please reach out if you love the ideas uh, or if you think we missed something, please let council know about that. And anything else? Yes, sure. Uh, on the council agenda, will that be first read, second read, a vote? Uh, uh, because uh, this is not an ordinance, it's just a resolution, it will just be one read. So on Tuesday. Yeah. And then the work starts after that. Well, very good. Thank oh, one more. Yes. Um, because I work primarily with the homeless community, are there any specific um, initiatives that you hope to implement in this plan that will affect uh, yes, uh, so we come at homelessness from a lot of different angles, and one of them this year we have some savings from 2014, and uh, I've recommended in the budget that we use some of that to support the uh, Welcome Home effort, which is a homeless project up on the business loop for veterans. And uh, I personally can't think of a better use of savings than, than helping homeless vets. 
but um, you know that's that's part of the work homelessness is a much bigger issue than that and so we won't be finished uh, with just that but that's one example where we do something about that it, Yes. Uh, how does your plan um, um, affect uh, the growth and development of women and minority businesses? Uh, thank you for that question. If you didn't hear it, it's how does the plan affect the growth and development of, of women and minority-owned businesses? Uh, I referenced it just briefly in the, in the speech where uh, we want to sort of get out of the way of small businesses. So we have a lot of ordinances, you might say, a lot of red tape both from the federal government, a lot from the federal government, some from the state, and some we've put there ourselves that make it very hard for a, uh, a small company to, to compete. For example, if you get a request for a proposal from us, it's about this thick, right, if you print it out. Just reading that's an intimidating thing for a small business person. They don't have time, right? Time is money, and uh, when you're small, you gotta, you gotta focus on revenue. So just reading that's an obstacle. So we're going to look at things we can do. Uh, maybe we could do a one pager, you know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Sounds, talk about poverty. This is really impossible, right? Uh, <clears throat> no, but things like that. And what kind of rules we put up there, you know, we, we have in many cases, uh, you have to have a million dollars worth of insurance to do business with us. And that's because we want to protect ourselves and the taxpayer from any negative outcome, well, maybe not everything we buy needs to have a million dollars of insurance, right? So, so we're going to look at that and see where can we kind of get real about what we're buying. Uh, we also want to get involved and help those businesses learn how to uh, get on our pre-selected bidders list, right? So get through all the paperwork so we know who you are and, and we can just hire you when we need you. And, and uh, there's a lot, a lot of work to that. So. That's one, two examples of what we're thinking about. One more thing, and I'll shut up. Okay. <laughs> I'd just like to remind everyone that, that even though persons with disabilities are not specifically mentioned in the affordable housing, things like that, equity and wages, and forming businesses, those type of things, I hope we all keep in mind that this strategic plan also refers to people with disabilities and we're really anxious to work with you on uh, continuing with the project. Thank you for mentioning it specifically. We probably should. Uh, it certainly does. And the thing about poverty, you know, it hits every group you could define. And. Uh, uh, the truth is, in our community, you know, it, while it's definitely uh, growing more quickly, it's more concentrated than the African American community. Uh, I, uh, clearly, the the community with disabilities is also uh, struggling with a lot of poverty. It's hard to get by on the revenue you can get. So it's it's uh, universal housing is something that's included with our net zero. And that means uh, you build a house where everyone can reach the drawers and the cabinets, right? It's more complicated than that. But. Uh, I just want to thank the uh, city manager and also uh, city council and everybody going through this process. Really, it's, I'm always one that critiques. You know, I went through the 600 page budget, I fell asleep like twice going through it. <laughs> so, you know, I've always been one to uh, try to share and at least connect with individuals that don't necessarily get a chance to come here. You know, we got 60% of our youth. It's very difficult for them to get employment to compete with the students here in town. We have a lot of our uh, communities of modest youth. They don't necessarily like to be called impoverished. Uh, we have individuals who have barriers, legal barriers, social barriers. And so I'm the one talking to a lot of the youth, especially the ones that are vibrant and ready to uh, protest. But also I go to the jails and talk to them as far as how to the process to come back. I remember going to two presidents and talking to them about the Vander Box process before they came back to share, to prepare them to share their story and have their story ready when they come back. And so they were invigorated by that. Uh, but also that when we look at a community and we have so many different individuals that are trying to do their best to make this place great, 
and we, you know, we look back and we still have these things that are there and wondering how it is for there. I really appreciate you guys being able to really turn that mirror around and look at us and give us a good view. And my question is, you know, how do we uh, illustrate this to the ones that aren't, to the ones that, that you know, in poverty, the last thing that you're going to do is be able to come to me. The last thing that you're going to be able to do is, you know, you don't you have a digital divide, you don't have a because the library, you got two hours, and you can use that time for certain things. So how are you guys going to illustrate um, this process and also keep yourself accountable as you go along? And I'll close with this. There's a line in one of my songs that goes, you know, I live in poverty, even though I'm a professional person in the community. But based on that, the number of kids I have, I got eight for So based on the number of kids I have, I'm still in poverty. So just, just so you know, a lot of individuals that move in this community might still be in that and you don't have to act like you are. But there's a line one of my songs that goes, we was cool until they called us pop. We have riches beyond compare until we wanted more. And so for these communities, they didn't necessarily know that there was an issue with how they lived until we tried to address it. And so for a lot of these families, they have joy and happiness and they're fine. But for the ones that, that are having some issues, I think that for a lot of the efforts you have to Thank you for all those comments. Uh, one of the questions there was, how are we going to get the word out about this? And that's really central to the plan. And that's uh, where we're going to get out there, into the neighborhoods. We're going to pick three areas. And, and we're going to do all of our work out there. So uh, rather than uh, being here at City Hall and saying, you got our number, right? It's kind of like a bad relationship, right? You know where I am, right? Call me when you. <clears throat> uh, we're gonna get out there, and we're gonna we're gonna tell them, uh, you know, why we're there, and see what they want. You're right. Uh, you know, uh, we're not gonna let the words come out of our mouth. We're the government, and we're here to help, right? That's uh, that's not what we want to say. In either of these places. Yes. Presentation. I couldn't help but keep thinking of the book, excellent book entitled uh, The Spirit Level. And the theme of that book is that uh, ongoing or growing disparities and inequities will eventually lead to decline and flight in communities. And so I think that really brings home that uh, your effort in this and everybody's effort in is something that's both urgent and mandatory. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, it's getting warmer in here. I'll have to talk to the council about no. Uh, so, uh, is there one more? Okay, one last. There you are. I was on city council. I had conversations with Don Claypole, and he was the president of Lintec Community College. He was interested in partnering with Columbia Career Center and putting a campus here. Has anyone followed up on that? I know there have been at least two other conversations about that. Uh, it hasn't borne fruit at this point, but uh, certainly would love to see them here. And uh, maybe we can get together and exchange contacts there and make sure I'm talking to the right person. Uh, great idea. Okay. Well, with that, I think there are donuts left and a little more coffee, so uh, thank you for coming.